The Face in the Fog by Craig Groshek Narrated by Otis Gyrie Years ago, I lived in a large two-story house that overlooked Pilcha Tree Farm in Arlington, Washington. I owned 50 acres of beautiful land filled with horses and dogs, with my own private 25-stall barn and an indoor area for riding during the winter. I named my equestrian center Dutch Mills Farm because most of my family is from Holland. For 15 years, I lived happily in that home with my wife, earning a living boarding and breeding the horses of the well-to-do in and around town, for a fair price, of course. Unfortunately, all that happiness came to a horrible end as I looked up my bathroom window one foggy, moonlit night. The night it happened, a beautiful full moon illuminated the tree farm next door, the thick layer of fog, looked like an enormous white blanket of cotton lying across the top of the trees. As I watched and listened peacefully to the sounds of the rural countryside through my open window, all of that tranquil beauty was interrupted suddenly as a dark shape slowly lifted out of the fog and then slowly disappeared from sight. In the short time it took the shadow to flit in and out of the fog, I didn't get a good look at it, and so I had no idea what it was. It didn't return, and I had a big day the next morning, so I had no choice but to shrug it off. I shut the window, uh, turned in for the night, and forgot all about it. A few days later, I found myself settled down and ready to climb into bed, looking forward to relaxing with the local newspaper and catching up on current events. As I began to peruse the day's stories, my eye was drawn to one title in particular. Authorities continue search for livestock thieves. According to the news report, there had been several incidents in recent days involving animals disappearing, mainly cows, goats, and a few horses. One report mentioned that a cow had been found mutilated in an unusual fashion. Apparently, it had been sawn in half, right down the middle. After reading the gruesome reports, I started making sure all of my horses were locked away in the stalls at night instead of letting them roam about, and my dogs were locked inside before sunset as well. It was near midnight the next night when I found myself restless and having trouble falling asleep. In no mood to spend the night tossing and turning, I slowly forced myself up and quietly found my way to the master bath, trying not to wake my wife. I grabbed a glass and filled it with water, then fumbled around the top drawer trying to find my sleeping pills. A few minutes later, after swallowing a pill or two, I found myself staring once more at the tree farm, again bathed in a sea of eerie fog. Whether it was because of the recent news reports I had read, or simply because of the remarkably similar weather, the memory of the other night crept back to the surface of my mind. I couldn't tell you how long I stood there, staring, but it was long enough for the medicine to start kicking in. Eventually I decided to go to bed, but then, just as I turned to head out of the bathroom, it happened. The dark shape emerged from the fog. I watched with a combination of dread and fascination as the shadowy figure rose above the quilt of fog. It looked like... It looked like a human head. No torso, no appendages. Just a bulbous head hovering in the fog. It must have been the size of a car. I squinted my eyes in an attempt to get a better look, but the medication made it hard to focus. I thought I could make out some features. It seemed feminine, in a way. A moment later, I froze in my terror. My God, it was staring directly at me. But the next thing I knew, everything went black. By the time my wife discovered me lying unconscious in the bathroom, it was early morning, and the sun was just beginning to peek over the tree line. 
As I came out of my medication-induced haze, I became aware that I must have completely destroyed the glass I had been drinking from the night before. Dozens of jagged shards littered the tile floor. Then, just as I began to consider how lucky it was that I hadn't cut myself, the events of the prior evening came creeping back, and soon I remembered what I had seen. I dared not tell anyone. Besides, it may have been nothing more than a hallucination, the impossible apparition, a product of my medication. I rationalized that everything I'd witnessed had been my imagination, not some giant monster roaming the nearby forest. In the end, I decided not to share my experiences with my family or friends. They never would have believed me anyway. Later that same evening, however, the fog rolled in yet again, a recurring reminder of the things I'd seen, or thought I'd seen. As I lay in bed, my curiosity began to grow. As I lay in bed, my curiosity began to grow until at last it threatened to consume me. I had to be sure, had to confirm that the ghastly apparition was nothing more than a byproduct of my medication and not something else. Instead of popping a pill that night, I grabbed my camera and made a commitment to wait until midnight in order to satisfy my curiosity. If the thing I'd seen was indeed a hallucination, resulting from my daily cocktail of exhaustion and drugs, the truth would soon become clear. And if it was still there, well, I preferred not to consider that. When the appointed time came, I got out of bed and grabbed my camera off the nightstand beside my bed. I made it to the window without incident and raised the camera to eye level, prepared to document my findings, or lack thereof. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the rise and fall of my wife's chest as she slept heavily. In a way, I envied her. As far as sleep was concerned, she was my polar opposite. Whereas I couldn't sleep a wink without a sleep aid in those days, there was a good chance she could nap through a hurricane and literally depended on me to wake her in the morning. I sighed and turned back to the task at hand. That night, the previously full moon was waning, and as a result, it was much darker than it had been on previous nights. The thickest fog I'd seen in years complicated things further, but in spite of the reduction in visibility, the moon still cast enough light for me to see for some distance. So I stood there, like a sentry guarding a frontier outpost, waiting for something, anything, to happen. I waited for over an hour without spotting anything out of the ordinary. It's then that I began to feel like an idiot. What on earth am I doing? I thought to myself. I ought to be in bed, getting some much-needed sleep, not staring at a deserted stretch of forest. Resigning myself to the fact that my medication was far too strong in causing me to see things, and making a mental note to speak with my doctor in the morning about switching prescriptions, I put the camera in the bathroom drawer. That way, I wouldn't need to explain to my wife what I was doing with the camera in the middle of the night. Then I closed the drawer and took one last look out the window. And I froze. My blood turned to ice in my veins. My heart leapt into my throat. I couldn't breathe. No, it couldn't be, I thought. It is impossible. Hovering above the fog, a monstrous face stared at me, its large, orb-like eyes gazing directly into mine while it emitted an unsettling, monotonous humming sound. A palpable dread overtook me. I'd never been so afraid in my life. I'd seen that look before upon the visage of a feral cat as it eyes an unsuspecting squirrel. Then, seemingly out of nowhere and quite unexpectedly, 
The face, which still to me resembled a woman's, smiled, actually smiled at me. A smile so sincere that had it not been for what it did next, I might have admitted to being a poor judge of character and called it benevolent. In moments, the smile faded from the thing's face as it first parted its lips and then began licking them. The way it swayed and hummed, like the low pitch wind of the wind passing through hollow reeds, was so hypnotic, almost sensual, that I didn't notice at first when it began salivating. I stared for what I am sure was only moments, but felt like hours, before I realized there was more to it, her, than just a face. Below its fantastically enormous head, it had several twisted arm-like appendages. At the end of one of these, clutched in what can only be described as a horribly disfigured hand, was a fully grown cow. As I watched the morbid scene spellbound, it brought the animal to its gaping mouth. All the while the cow strained against its captor struggling to escape, and made the most horrible sounds I've ever heard escape from a living thing. Unbelievably, my wife slept through the whole thing. Then, as quickly as the monster had appeared, it bit the cow in half and swallowed first one end of it, then the other without chewing. I vomited over and over again, heaving and retching until my stomach ached. When the pain finally subsided, I rose fearfully and gazed out the window, praying that it would be gone, but it wasn't. As I watched in horror, the thing parted its gore-soaked lips, exposing row upon row of serrated razor-like teeth and lapped up the rivulets of blood streaming down its vile face, humming and swaying all the while in its sickingly seductive way. Then, as quickly as it had come, it vanished into the same fog from which it had emerged. When I emerged from my stupor several minutes later, I realized I hadn't taken a single picture of the thing. I hadn't even attempted it. I cursed myself silently while I checked to make sure all the doors and windows were locked and all the shades drawn, then inhaled a couple of sleeping pills and collapsed on the downstairs, blocking out until dawn. The next day, I investigated the area where the monster had appeared, half expecting to find that my experience had been a dream. Near the tree line, however, exactly where the thing had appeared the night before, there was evidence to the contrary. Enough congealed blood, along with fragments of bone and matted, oily tufts of black and white fur, to convince even the most stalwart city dweller that the gruesome remains before them had once belonged to a cow. I made plans to have my horses moved immediately, and I found a place for my wife and I to rent until I could sell our property. I rushed my wife into a cheap motel in town several miles away, with only the briefest of explanations, simply showing her the newspaper article about the livestock disappearances, and telling her I saw a large pack of wolves outside our window the other night, and I was certain they were responsible, and we were going to come after our horses next. She bought it, thankfully. I made the decision to stay at Dutch Mill's farm one more night. To this day, I don't know why, but I felt utterly compelled to see the thing again, to get a picture of it. I wanted, no, needed proof. And maybe, just maybe, I wanted to see it sway and hear it hum one more time. Just one last time. Once more, I took a pass on my sleeping pills and waited near the window until midnight, camera by my side. For hours, I waited patiently, 
fully expecting to see it raise its head out of the fog in preparation for another grisly display, but nothing happened. Disappointed but remaining vigil, I went to bed with the only gun I owned under my pillow, and I slept fairly well, knowing I had a loaded weapon mere inches from my face, and that my family was in a motel miles from there. The next morning I awoke to the familiar sound of birds chirping, of leaves rustling in the trees. I stretched, got up, got dressed, and walked over to the large bedroom window and opened the curtain. Where I expected to see the usual panoramic view of the neighboring tree farm, with the blue sky overhead and green trees as far as the eye could see, I instead found myself staring at a pair of lip prints about four feet across on my window. Failing to realize what it all meant at first, my thoughts at first was that it looked like dripping lipstick. But I knew better. As I looked closer, my fears were confirmed. The lip prints were made of blood. The blood of what or whom, I hope I never find out. As abhorrent as the scene was, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. I stood transfixed, staring for what felt like hours, and then another realization hit me. The bloody prints were not on the outside of my window. They were on the inside. The message was clear. This thing, she, was inside my house while I was sleeping, under the influence of sleeping pills and unable to be roused, and could have done worse to me than she did to the cow. Whether the bloody prints were a threat or a goodbye kiss, I will never know. I didn't want to find out. That same morning I cleaned up the bloody mess, packed up and hightailed it. I never looked back, never did get to take a picture, and never got the proof I thought I wanted. Not that I needed any. I never did tell my family, friends, or the police about any of what happened. They would sooner have me institutionalized than take my word about something so unbelievable. And I stopped taking my medication. I simply couldn't handle the thought of something creeping up on me again while I sleep. And I have alarms on all of my doors and windows. It took some time to convince my wife of the need when she had no idea what had happened to me, but I can be persuasive when I mean to be. All things considered, however, it's not the lack of evidence or closure that bothers me most to this day. The second-floor bedroom window in my new home also overlooks a field, which until this past week had provided a wonderfully scenic view of a nearby river and an oak and maple-studded forest beyond. What bothers me most these days is that on certain foggy nights, when I can't sleep and refuse to take a sleeping pill again, I can't help but go to the window and keep vigil. And on some of those nights, when the beautiful full moon cast its glow upon the wilderness beyond my yard, when the thick layer of fog again resembles an enormous white blanket of cotton lying across the top of the trees, I watch and listen, and I swear I can make out dark shapes hovering quietly in the gathering mist watching me before they disappear into the forest. And most nights, I can make out the faintest humming sound carried upon the breeze, like the low-pitched whine of the wind passing through hollow reeds. 